Hello, welcome back to the second course in physics. And in this lecture, we will conclude our discussion of geometrical optics. So here, we will be uh, talking about the lenses and the optical instruments. And uh, the contents of this lecture will include an introduction, a historical introduction. Uh, we will talk about the prisms, we will talk about lenses and derive the lens equations. Types of lenses will be discussed. Thin lens approximation will be used in order to derive the uh, lens equation. The uh, compound lenses will be uh, talked about. And then we will start discussing the optical instruments where the magnifiers and microscopes will be discussed. Uh, magnifying glasses will be uh, the formulas relevant to magnifying glasses will be derived and then we will talk about the microscope as a combination of uh, different lenses and components and then uh, we will uh, discuss the telescope and the different types of telescopes the Galilean telescope the astronomic astronomical telescope and the terrestrial telescope and finally, we will mention the principle of the camera. And uh, with this, we uh, start our discussion of this lecture by introducing uh, some concepts. And to begin with, we, uh, we, mention, we would like to mention that, uh, as we have said before, that optics is one of the most ancient branches of science and, uh, and uh, some of the evidences uh, on this statement have been seen by the remains that have been found uh, from ancient civilizations. For example, mirrors were found to be used uh, a long time ago uh, for uh, to to form images where uh, where the mirror being the most ancient optical device was used by Egyptians about 4000 uh, BC uh, to form images and uh, magnifying uh, objects made of glass were used by ancient Chaldeans of Mesopotamia so these are evidences of how old and ancient is this uh, knowledge uh, on optics, geometrical optics specifically. The uh, Arabian scientist Al Hazen has been the first to recognize that the eye, in modern terms actually, is simply a tiny camera with a transparent lens. So the, this knowledge was, by that time of al Hazen was well developed. And now we start our discussion on optical instruments and components by talking about the prisms and how they work and uh, the um, dispersion of light by the prism where uh, a beam of light, white light, uh, uh, falling on to one side of the prism will leave it uh, in different colors as this uh, background picture shows. And uh, the prism is an optical system that can be used to analyze light thus into its component colors. And uh, this is due to the fact that uh, the uh, refractive, uh, the index of refraction n prime for the material of the prism is dependent on the uh, wavelength of the light that falls on it or the frequency of light and that gives the uh, phenomenon of dispersion as we mentioned uh, previously. Uh, high magnification uh, optical instruments that were in demand some time ago, and the problem of chromatic aberration that is associated with the buildup of such instruments uh, led to serious uh, attention to the uh, so-called phenomenon of colors, 
uh, and that uh, that problem or that phenomenon was being studied uh, has been being uh, investigated since the time of uh, De Descartes and and Newton due to the significance and the importance of these uh, of this phenomenon uh, on the uh, uh, development of uh, uh, high quality optical systems such as uh, telescopes and microscopes and so on and uh, Newton was working on this phenomenon and he was working with uh, prisms and in 1666 he did quite a bit of work on the uh, an analysis uh, of white light by prisms and the synthesis of white light by uh, uh, combining the uh, different uh, components of the colors back into, uh, into uh, white color. And this experiment illustrates the principle of the uh, analysis of white light where here we have white light falling on one side of the prism and uh, due to the dispersion uh, the colors are, uh, uh, are separated from each other so uh, here we will have the red color on, on, uh, on the top and on the bottom we will have the uh, violet uh, color and all the co other colors in, in between so the, the, the white color will split into its components and uh, what Newton did uh, to investigate this phenomenon of uh, analyzing the uh, white uh, light into its component colors is that he selected uh, one color, let's say the red color for example, the red beam, he selected this by putting an aperture in the, in the, in the way and he made this component color uh, fall onto another prism, uh, P prime and then he found that this uh, light, uh, this component color does not split into any more uh, uh, primary uh, colors or uh, components uh, in which case he derived that or he concluded that those colors are primary colors and they cannot be analyzed any further into, uh, into component colors uh, so this is the kind of uh, the analysis, this is what explains the analysis of uh, the white, color, uh, white uh, light into its components. And as for the synthesis, he, uh, what Newton did is, first of all, he got um, the component colors of the white ray by, uh, by analyzing it, by analyzing a white uh, beam uh, uh, using a prism P. So uh, behind prism P we see uh, the set of uh, component colors ranging from red to violet. Then what he did is that he inverted another, uh, another prism which is P prime, he inverted it and he put it in the way of these component colors and uh, uh, doing so these component colors he noticed that they join together back together and, uh, and he sees uh, out of the second uh, prism P prime uh, simply white color coming emerging back. So this is the resynthesis or the co combination, uh, recombining the component colors into back into the original white beam. And this, uh, this is an illustration of Newton's, uh, of Newton's experiments. And now, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, experiments done on uh, prisms and the, uh, and the uh, uh, deviation uh, of the beam uh, of, a monochromatic, uh, of a monochromatic ray, a monochromatic ray as has been shown by Newton's experiment does not split into any more uh, uh, component colors. So if, if we um, uh, if we have an, an incident beam of monochromatic ray, like red ray, for example, or green, or uh, yellow, one of the component colors, if it's falling on the face, on one of the faces of the prism, it will remain one beam, one color, 
exactly, but it will suffer deviation. And the uh, angular deviation delta of this monochromatic beam uh, depends on the refractive index of the material in prime and on the uh, geometry of the prism, uh, meaning on, uh, for example, the apex uh, angle, uh, alpha, uh, on how the, uh, how the prism is constructed. And uh, here, if we look for some, some geometrical uh, relations, we notice that the angle alpha, which is the apex angle, and this is the same as this, this angle, is simply equal to uh, this angle theta 1 prime plus theta 2 prime. And uh, delta, delta is this angle, simply. And this angle delta is equal to this angle, which is theta 1 minus theta 1 prime, plus this angle, which is theta 2 minus theta 2 prime. Thus, taking into consideration alpha, what it is, then delta is equal to theta 1 plus theta 2 minus alpha. This is the angle of deviation. And uh, we remind ourselves with, uh, of Snell's law. Uh, so in going uh, across this interface from uh, the uh, medium with n, with the index of refraction n, into the uh, prism medium with the refractive index n prime, we have n sine theta 1 is equal to n prime sine theta 1 prime. And uh, we have, in going from the medium inside the uh, prism outside to the medium with n, where, where, uh, where the prism is uh, immersed in, uh, in this case, we have the uh, uh, index of refraction uh, n times sine theta is equal to n prime uh, times th sine theta 2 prime. So n sine theta 2 is equal to n prime sine theta 2 prime uh, is uh, applicable to the second interface where, where this ray is falling and it's emerging at theta 2. So these are the relations that are relevant to the problem of uh, the behavior or the path of the ray as it goes into the prism and then leaving the prism uh, in the case of a, a monochromatic ray because if we have a, co a compound ray like white, ray, uh, white light, it will split into its different components. Uh, we have four uh, independent equations and eight variables, as we noticed from the, four different, uh, from the previous four equations. And uh, with four equations, we can solve only for four, uh, uh, four uh, unknowns. And thus, um, eight of the variables that appear in the previous four equations, have uh, 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 four of them should be known. So for example, if we know the uh, refractive index of the medium in which the prism is immersed in, if we know the angle of uh, uh, incidence onto the first face, the left face of the prism, and if we know the uh, uh, apex angle of the, uh, of the uh, uh, prism, and if we know the angle of deviation uh, of the ray as it emerges from the, from the prism, because we can always measure it. So these are easy things to know, to determine. The angle of the prism itself, the angle of incidence, because we can measure it, the angle, the deviation angle as it leaves, as the ray leaves the prism, we can measure it, and n, the refractive index of the medium in which the prism is set. If we know these, if these are known, we have four, uh, four remaining unknowns, variables that are unknowns, which are n prime, theta 1 prime, theta 2 prime, and theta. Uh, and we have four simultaneous equations. We can solve these four equations, and we can, in principle, find these four unknowns. But the calculation can be really complicated that we need numerical methods uh, to, to uh, solve these four equations and to find uh, the, all these four variables. However, if we are interested in, in uh, determining, uh, for example, one 
one, um, one parameter, which is, for example, the index of refraction of the prism. We can find the index of refraction of the prism by the method which is called the minimum deviation method, delta minimum, and from the principle of re reversibility of the path. And uh, this method uh, can be used by simply uh, making the ray fall onto one face of the, of the prism and then keep uh, uh, rearranging the angle of incidence by rotating the prism until we have a minimum deviation uh, for the light emerging from the other side of the prism. So uh, in this case, uh, if we have this minimum deviation, uh, which is simply set by rotating the prism slightly, we will find that the, uh, the, the angle delta will, will, starts, uh, will start decreasing as we rotate one, uh, the, the prism one way, will start decreasing and in, then will start increasing. So at the minimum value of delta, delta minimum, we stop. At that point from the principle of reversibility of the, uh, of the uh, passage of the ray, which means that if we make the ray fall this way, then it will emerge that way. If we reverse the problem, if we make it fall this way from the right, it will emerge, uh, it will follow exactly the same path and will emerge uh, from the left, uh, following exactly the same path. That's the principle of reversibility. Uh, from this, we, uh, we conclude that theta one is equal to theta two which is called theta in this case, and theta one prime is equal to theta two prime, which we call theta prime in this case. And in this case, theta prime is equal to alpha over two, and uh, theta is equal to delta minimum plus alpha all over two divided by two, in which case n prime, using uh, Snell's law, is equal to n times sine one half delta minimum plus alpha over sine alpha over two. And uh, if these uh, quantities are measured, alpha is measured, unknown, and uh, delta minimum is measured at the minimum uh, deviation uh, geometry of the problem, then n prime can be calculated from this angle. This can be done uh, by a simple experiment. And now, uh, after uh, talking about this component, we move to, to, to talk about lenses, which are some of the most important uh, uh, components of uh, optical instruments. Uh, previously, in the previous lecture, we have talked about mirrors, uh, spherical mirrors, which are also, which could be important in optical uh, instruments. And now we talk about lenses, the second uh, 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 important set of components of the optical instruments. Uh, lenses are uh, optical systems that are used in most optical instruments that are known. And uh, a, a lens uh, is defined as uh, a refracting medium, like glass, for example, uh, that is bound by two spherical surfaces. That is a lens, two spherical refracting surfaces. The centers of these two surfaces lie on a line, on the same line, which is called the optic axis of this component of the lens. So that's the definition of the lens. And uh, the types of lenses accordingly, using this, uh, using this uh, definition, uh, are either convergent lenses, convergent lenses or divergent lenses. And these, uh, these shapes uh, are examples of lenses. So here, uh, in each case, we see that the lens uh, consists of a refracting medium bound by two spherical surfaces. This is a spherical surface, and this is another spherical surface. This is a spherical surface, and this is another spherical surface with a refracting medium in between. The image, because we have two 
refracting spherical surfaces uh, for the lens. Thus, the uh, image that is formed for the object by the first surface, the first surface makes an image. And this image made by the first surface will be conceived or uh, will be considered like the object for the second surface. And uh, it makes the final image. So like, for example, if we consider uh, this kind of lens, which is bound between two convex uh, lenses, uh, I mean s surfaces, uh, like this, uh, then the, the, uh, this is the object point. Uh, as it falls on the first surface, a refractive surface, uh, it, it tends to make, if this is the only surface that exists, then the, the image will be at S prime. However, this, uh, the, these rays, these refracted, refracted rays, are intercepted by the second surface. And the second surface is also a refracting surface. It's, it's a concave surface with respect to, this, to these rays. So these rays are like object rays falling onto this surface, and they are refracted to form the image, which is S double prime. So this S double prime is the final image uh, for this, uh, for this uh, optical system. And uh, similarly, if we have uh, this type of lens, then again, the same thing. The, uh, the image will, uh, as, as the light rays are refracted, the image will appear as if it's coming from S prime. That's the image formed by the first surface. And then these rays uh, will uh, look like rays coming from an object with respect to the second surface. And they will diverge. And then S double prime will be the final image point uh, for, this, uh, for this lens type. So this is the principle of how a lens works, how the two surfaces work together to form one single uh, image point. Uh, and now it is uh, a difficult task to, to follow up on the analysis of the image and the image construction by any uh, system, uh, by any optical system. So we use for convenience what we call the thin lens approximation, where the lens is really considered thin with respect to the distances, to the radius of curvature, to the, uh, to the distance of the uh, image point or the... Um, or the object point. So uh, this lens is considered a thin lens where the thickness is really uh, has, has to be uh, very small with respect to all other distances. And uh, in, the, in this case, the uh, small s and uh, s1 and uh, small s prime, uh, uh, s and s prime are the distances of the object and uh, uh, object point and the image point as we have uh, defined previously in the case of the spherical mirrors and the spherical surfaces and uh, putting uh, all of these uh, things together we uh, uh, and, and using the formula that we have derived for uh, spherical surfaces, for the refraction from a spherical surface that we have obtained before, we have the equation n over s1 plus n prime over s1 prime is equal to n prime minus n over r1. That is uh, for the first surface, that is the image s1 prime formed by the first surface. And uh, this defines the first focal length f1, which is equal to n times r1 for the first surface, divided by n prime minus n. This is as far as the first surface is, is uh, concerned. And then when we take into consideration the second surface, for the second surface, n prime, that's where the light is coming from the object inside of n prime, which is the material of the lens itself, divided by s2, which is the object with respect the object uh, uh, distance with respect to the second surface is equal to n, which is the index of refraction of the material where the image is formed, uh, divided by S2 prime, which is the image uh, made by the second surface, is equal to n 
minus n prime over R2, which is the radius of curvature of the uh, second, uh, of the second uh, surface. So this is as far as the second surface is concerned. These uh, relations are exactly the same relation that we have derived before for a spherical surface. And we put this, uh, and we find that the second focal point, F2 prime, is equal to n r2 over n minus n prime. Uh, now, taking into consideration the thin lens approximation that we talked about, that means the thickness of the lens is much smaller than all these distances, s and s prime and r1 and r2. And uh, thus, we conclude with this approximation that s2 S2 is the, is the object distance with respect to the second surface. And th this sh should be equal to minus S1 prime. It's exactly the same if we, if we ignore T, the thickness of the lens. Uh, uh, and this is because S1 prime is negative and S2 is positive. So minus S1 prime is equal to S2. And uh, putting these things together, we uh, get the relation N over S1 plus n over s2 prime is equal to n prime minus n times 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2. This, uh, this relation is very useful, and uh, in the process of, we are in the process of obtaining the uh, final equation for the lens. Uh, now, substituting s1 is equal to s, which is the object's distance, S1 is from the first surface. So if we define S as the object distance, object point distance, from instead of from the first surface or the second surface, we consider it from the center of the lens. So S1 is approximately, in the thin, thin lens approximation, equals to S, uh, to S. And S2 prime is equal to S prime. We and we, we call N prime over N, we call it NR, the relative uh, index, uh, index of refraction in R prime, putting these things together, we, uh, we uh, get the relation 1 over S plus 1 over S prime is equal to N R prime minus 1 times 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2, which is the lens maker's equation. This is a very important equation for the construction of lenses with desired uh, properties. And uh, the first focal uh, point F and the second focal point F prime are determined from the location of the object whose image is at infinity and from the location of the image point of an object at infinity as we have done. Thus, 1 over F is the same as 1 over F prime is equal to uh, N prime R sub R minus 1 times 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2, and taking into consideration what is 1 over F1 definition, and one, what is 1 over F2 prime, as we have talked about a little while ago, uh, then this quantity, 1 over F, is simply 1 over F1 prime, uh, over 1 over F1, plus 1 over F2 prime that we have derived uh, previously. And uh, thus, we get the Gaussian form of the uh, of the lens maker's equation, which states that 1 over s, the distance of the object from the lens, plus 1 over s prime, the distance of the image point from the lens, is equal to 1 over f, which is 1 over the focal length for the, uh, for the uh, lens, which is, uh, which is uh, d determined by this, uh, by this uh, equation. So this, is, uh, this finalizes the lens maker's equation. And uh, the, again, the dioptry or the power of the lens is uh, defined as d is equal to 1 over f, as we have uh, stated for the definition of the dioptry. And uh, thus, for a convergent lens, f prime is on the right side of the lens, and thus d is positive d is greater than 0. That's why we call a convergent lens a positive lens. And uh, uh, vice versa, uh, the, uh, the divergent lens, uh, in the divergent lens, f prime is on the left, and thus d is smaller than 0. 
and uh, that's why we call the divergent lens a negative lens. So a convergent lens is called a positive lens, dioptery is positive, and a divergent lens is called a negative lens, the dioptery of which is, uh, is uh, negative. Um, and uh, now if n prime is greater than n, the material of uh, the index of refraction of the material of the lens is greater than n, the medium in which it is placed, then the lens is convergent if it is thicker at the center where the focal uh, length f is greater than zero. And uh, this is the case. So uh, these types of lenses are convergent or positive lenses. And vice versa, uh, the lens is divergent if it is thicker at the ends uh, where f is negative. And uh, this, these types of lenses are divergent uh, or negative lenses. And uh, the uh, magnification in the thin lens uh, approximation uh, is that uh, for uh, the, surface, the first surface, as we have derived before, m1 is equal to minus n times s1 prime over n prime s1. And m2 is equal to minus n prime times s2 prime over n times s2. We are applying the same formula that we have talked about before for the spherical surfaces. And uh, we recall uh, that s2 is equal to, s to minus s1 prime. And the total magnification of the lens is simply the magnification of the first surface times the magnification due to the second surface, multiplying these two together and making the right substitution. This is equal to, the magnification is equal to S prime minus S prime divided by S. This is the magnification formula for the lens. If the image is on the right side of the lens, the image is real. S prime is greater than zero and thus it is inverted since M from the formula of M, M becomes negative. So it's a, a real image is inverted. And if the image is to the uh, left of, uh, of the lens that is in the same side of the object point, then it is virtual and thus the magnification uh, is, is positive and uh, then the image is upright. So uh, uh, again, a virtual image is upright and, an and a real image is inverted. And uh, now we talk about the compound lenses. These are the simple lenses, but what are the compound lenses? Compound lenses are several coaxial lenses uh, or combinations of lenses uh, that are put together to perform a certain behavior in an optical instrument and these are used uh, uh, to overcome s uh, special types of aberrations and to be useful in uh, optical systems that give the desired behavior. The uh, combinations of lenses or compound lenses are selected and arranged to produce uh, optical instruments that we desire with special characteristics. Uh, to give the magnification, to give the uh, uh, configuration that, that we would like to, to obtain, as we will be talking about. Now, if it is worth mentioning that if two coaxial thin lenses are put together face to face, uh, the first one uh, of uh, focal length f1 and the second is of focal length f2, if they are put together in contact, then the, they form a compound lens uh, the focal length of this compound lens one over, is given by 1 over f for the compound lens is equal to 1 over f1 plus 1 over f2. So this, uh, this is uh, a, a useful formula when we are dealing with uh, different lenses in, uh, put together. And now we move to talk about after we have uh, discussed the compo components, we, we are uh, in a position to talk about optical uh, instruments. And uh, the, uh, 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 first of all, we talk about magnifiers and mic microscopes, which are 
uh, which are instruments that are used to enlarge an image of a small object. These are what magnifiers and microscopes are for. And a simple microscope consists of a single lens or a compound lens, a magnifier, uh, simply a magnifier. And a compound microscope consists of two uh, sets or systems of lenses. One is called the objective and the other is called the eyepiece or the ocular uh, piece. Uh, and the objective forms a real enlarged image and this image is viewed in turn through the ocular which forms the final uh, image of desired characteristics. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the magnifying glass as a very simple uh, microscope. So this is the magnifying glass and if we have an, uh, uh, an object here, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the object is between the focal point and between the uh, uh, lens itself, it, it forms uh, an, enlarged, uh, an enlarged image, which is a virtual image, and this image can be viewed by the eye. So this is how we magnify the image. The magnifying power is the ratio of the angle phi subtended at the eye by the image to that angle phi note subtended by the object at the near point D1, uh, which is the uh, clearest, uh, uh, nearest distance at which we, uh, we can view the object uh, as clear as possible. And uh, the most comfortable vision of uh, the image is when the object is uh, at the focal point where the image is at infinity and the eye is relaxed. We can see it uh, with a relaxed uh, condition. And now uh, uh, this uh, how, uh, how the case looks like uh, if the object is, uh, uh, is at the focal point of the lens then the image is at infinity and the angle phi uh, is simply y, which is the height of the object, divided by the distance uh, f. This is actually tangent phi, not phi, but, uh, but uh, in, uh, because the object is very small, y is very small with respect to f, so tangent phi is equal to phi. And uh, similarly, if we just view the object directly at the closest distance, at the, uh, at the distance d naught, which is uh, the uh, a clear distance of vision of this object d naught here, then phi is uh, is equal phi naught is equal to y also the height of the object divided by d naught, and uh, the magnifying uh, the magnification is simply phi over phi naught which is d naught over f. And now we. Uh, discuss the microscope which works according to the same principle. In the case of the microscope, we have two sets of uh, uh, two systems, uh, th lens systems. So the, the, uh, the object uh, forms, uh, the first lens forms uh, uh, an image of the object and uh, this uh, uh, image of the object is, uh, is viewed by the second uh, lens as the object this image looks like an object for the second uh, lens and it forms a final object that is viewed by the eye. This is the objective uh, lens and this is the ocular or the eyepiece. And uh, in, in this case, if we, if we set the, uh, the uh, uh, object uh, at the focal point of the uh, objective lens, uh, F note, uh, and uh, and we set the uh, we make the image or a little bit slight slightly uh, farther than the focal point, and the uh, image uh, if we put it uh, such that it is on the focal uh, point for the second uh, eyepiece, then the uh, uh, the uh, uh, final image is at infinity and the eye observes it uh, or sees it with a in a relaxed condition 
and uh, then the magnification m naught is equal to y prime final uh, y prime uh, divided by y, which is minus l over f naught. That's from uh, from the uh, triangles, and uh, m sub e, uh, as we have found from the magnifying glass a little while ago, m sub e is equal to d naught over f sub e which means that the total magnification that uh, the, this microscope provides us with is MO uh, times M, uh, capital M sub E, which is minus L over F naught times D, D naught divided by FE. This uh, can, be, uh, can give uh, as large magnification as we want by selecting the right, uh, the right lenses. And typical values are L is equal to 18 centimeters and D naught is equal to 25 centimeters. So typical values of M is in M naught is equal uh, plus uh, times M E, which is minus L over F naught times D naught over F E, which is about, uh, with a minus sign of course, 450 divided by F1 times F2. These are typical values for a microscope. And now we talk about the telescope as another optical s uh, instrument to view distant objects. And the, uh, first of all, the Galilean telescope looks like this, where we observe the far away. It's, we, we think of, of it as coming from infinity with parallel rays through the, uh, this uh, lens. And uh, then the image is uh, formed and it's observed or uh, seen by another divergent lens. And uh, this was the Galilean tel telescope, which was uh, introduced in 1608. And the magnification for such a telescope is simply m prime is equal to minus f1 divided by f2, which is larger than 0 because f2 is negative. And the uh, second uh, telescope is the astronomical telescope, which is introduced by Kepler in 1611. And uh, this, in this telescope, uh, Kepler used uh, another uh, uh, convergent uh, lens uh, as uh, an, uh, an eyepiece rather than a divergent lens. And, uh, and in this case, the magnification is equal to minus F1 divided by F2, which is a negative. It's a number, magnification number, but it's negative in this case, uh, which means that the uh, image is inverted. And uh, finally, the terrestrial telescope uh, is the last type, which is uh, the telescope that we, uh, that another, uh, another lens, a third lens is used in order to make the image upright. And, uh, uh, and the magnification for this telescope is uh, simply F1 divided by F2, which is greater than zero. This is for the telescopes. And finally, the last uh, instrument that we have to mention is the camera. And the camera is an instrument that forms a small image of a larger object. It's just the other way around. And uh, the camera works according to the principle of the human eye. And uh, at this point, I end my discussion of the optical instruments, and uh, I thank you for your attention.